Hey everybody, good morning. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied voice, John, except he's not really a disembodied voice, he just tries to uh, type when we're, <laughs> instead of talking, which is great, because it means I don't have to put him in my ear and have a cord that I constantly yank out of my ear. So thanks, John. Thanks for just typing. <laughs> Much as we like to hear your voice and everything. Um, but uh, but yeah, so hi, guys. Yeah, you don't want to interrupt. That's cool. That's cool. You see Rock Troll, and you should see Rock Troll once I switch to minicam as well. Yes, we are rock trolling. We are trolling today. It's trolling Thursday. And uh, there we go. Good, good, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, I have two chairs. Actually, I have three different chairs in here today, guys. So one way or another, we are making it through this hour and a half long stream. <laughs> My back actually feels good this morning. It feels like you never know. Like you, you just like, you know, when you've got like, you know, you never know how much to push yourself. If you're me, you tend to over push. So you like try to correct. But uh, but yeah, so we're going to see. Yes, rock troll. We're rocking. We're rocking out. Actually, we are rocking out today because uh, we are doing rock trolls base. So we're actually painting rocks and 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 what will be water. Um, and I actually needed to kind of check on some of that, but oh, that's all right. We'll just we'll just you know we'll just go. We'll chill. It's chill. It's all about the chill today. So I did some extra green work. Oh, one one thing I do need to do though is to get my. Um, because remember, we painted him mostly with colors that were from the Dungeon Dwellers paint sets, right? So we are going to use Dungeon Gray for his base. So I want to get that color out. And I'm going to get out my Vampiric Mist because that's our lightener. Um, and then, hmm. So there's a school of thought. Uh, everybody, oops. Oh, it, it comes in and out. I'm not sure if it's, yeah, Reaper John would have a better idea probably or would be able to ask somebody coops. Um, yeah, I mean, it's always, it goes out of stock and they wait until it's out of stock to reorder it. So, hold on while I get everything settled out here. We're also probably using a little bit of our greens. Actually, let me get up and get those greens. I'm trying not to twist too much. So if I get up and leave the camera for a second, apologies, everybody. Just want to make sure that I am uh, trying to preserve the back today. I'm trying to be very mindful of how I am doing stuff. So let's see. We want a little bit of our goblin skin, probably. And that's about right. That's I think, I think I've got all of my colors that I'm going to need. I've got the linen. I think I mixed that bone color, I'm pretty sure, so... All things considered, I think we're good. I think we've got the colors we need. Maybe we need kobold scale because, well, everybody needs kobold scale. If everybody doesn't own kobold scale yet, they need to guy go out and buy it. It's really, really pretty dark brick red. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's some things with coops like with the with the bus because they don't sell particularly fast. Reaper will wait until um, it's out of you know, until we're out before we order more because they're not fast sellers compared to everything else. Alrighty, let's see here. Oh no, did I forget my palette? Oh, I'm such a dork. Oh, everybody, Anne, it's one of those days for Anne. Let you be alerted. Hold on. I'm gonna grab it. myself three times to grab my palette this morning apparently none of it sunk in none of it palette is here Anne is here palette is here rock troll is here we are now okay oh searching just bust comes up with nothing hey Jetta, how's it going yes good morning good morning good morning everybody yes i'm i am a little bit of a piece of work this morning <laughs> Since I forgot my palette after, you know, reminding myself umpteen zillion times. And I also forgot to lay out my paint before I started the stream. But I wanted to start on time. And so I was like, darn it. So, uh, all right. So mostly we're going to be using Dungeon Gray. However, oh, and we're wobbly. Autofocus. There. So I did some work, some more work on the base um, after the last stream. 
because there were some areas that were just very lumpy and I wanted to uh, kind of blend them in a little better. So I had kind of just a blob of rock back here, for example. And uh, so I added some little steps kind of going down into the flooring. Um, I blended in some areas a little bit more. I added some more little rocks here and there, just again, to help everything blend in. Again, a little bit blended back here. And I added another little rock over here so that I could uh, have everything kind of blend in, blend together. And then of course we have some little mushrooms that I did last time up here. So we have to decide on colors for those. Um, I probably should grab my black indigo because I'm going to want it for shadows. Now, there is a school of thought, everybody. It's not turned out yet. It's not done. Um, but thank you. Thank you, Liquid Nebula. But it's not done yet. It hasn't turned out yet. Uh, ah, he's not searchable because until we get more. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, the dragon lady? Yeah. Yeah, she was fun to paint. I used her for my for a Patreon article on blonde hair. And I think I used her for one on translucent cloth as well. All right, so I'm going to turn and see where my black indigo is hiding. There it is. Excellent. So there's a school of thought on basing, guys. And uh, Jeremy Bonamont from France, you know, and, and several other very, um, you know, like famous for lack of a better term, famous rock star type painters, uh, firmly believe in it. And the, the strategy is that use a little bit of your basing color on your model and vice versa. So whatever colors you're using on your model, you should also feature some of them in your basing is what these people believe. Um, there are also excellent painters who really hate this theory and never do it like David. <laughs> I am of a mixed opinion on this one. Um, I think that saying always is never a good thing. Uh, I always like to be flexible. That said, I do believe that in most cases, doing this will make your model look more like it belongs to the environment, which is why these people believe in this to begin with. So when you're integrating a model with its environment and you want the whole piece to like kind of work together artistically, then it is not a bad idea to take some of the colors from your rock troll and his stuff and, and uh, use them in the basing. Uh, hey there, Bob and Julie, how's it going? Awesome. So yeah, so we're going to start with just using like dungeon gray and black indigo to set up with a little bit of our vampiric uh, mist mixed in to set up some gray tones on this base. But we are probably going to mix in especially um, the orange color here because it's a ground color and it would be a color that you'd find in mineral formations. Um, so we'll use some orange and maybe a little bit of yellow mixed with it. Uh, we are probably, I don't know if I want to use the green I may use it kind of around the base here and there, just real subtle. When people say you should use the colors of your model in your basing, they're not talking about doing it like really overtly. They're more talking about mixing it in here and there so that it's just kind of, you know, a subconscious thing more than anything. Um, and coffee. <laughs> coffee is what your skin washes. You look like that's funny. All right, so let's mix up some colors and uh, we want to get kind of a range. And also I was thinking about the little pool that he's got that I made for him. Um, and I kind of want to do, I kind of want to do almost a reflection, like not a serious one, but this is going to be a very still pool and it's very, very shallow. So it's, um, it's not going to be a, like give you a big reflection, but it could get you, because it's so still, it could get us a little bit of the purple here and a little bit of the one cloth color, maybe a little touch of green um, and stuff like that. The thing with shallow, and I've been studying shallow water lately, so this is how I know. For those of you who are on my Discord, you should not be surprised because I actually used my car as an example <laughs> the other day. So you're always, essentially the bottom line is I'm always looking at stuff in my environment and observing it and trying to grok it so that I can paint using those examples. Um, oh, cobalt scale is just, was just a mixer in Ara. I used it. Uh, it's useful if you're doing, if you're making this brown. So the brown is a mixture of these two plus a touch of this and usually a little bit of yellow. Um, you want to get a pretty strong warm, depending on how warm you want it to be is how much of the goblin skin you use. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it's a, I mean, cobalt scale is a lovely color. I don't know why people wouldn't use it. It's a really high coverage red. Um, it's a brick red, so it's much warmer and it's not purple. So it's a very uh, versatile, like I would use it for mixing it into skin. 
um, to do like lip colors, blush colors, all that. It would be a great, if you don't want to go in the blue direction, it's a great color to use for that. I mean, you highlight it with any normal red. Uh, it's, you know, you could even highlight it with oranges if you just wanted to go up muted. Uh, which actually, it's, it's a key color in a uh, coaching project I'm about to start. So... What would a triad be for Cobalt Scale? Have I done that yet? Have I done triads for the Dungeon Dwellers? Well, thanks, John David Speaks. You have just given me my topic for $5 this month. <laughs> triads. Triads for the Dungeon Dwellers. Because ah, I use these darn things all the time. Like, I use the Dungeon Dwellers paints a ton now. Like, I regularly do. Because I, I like a fairly saturated, by saturated I mean bright, uh, color scheme. As you can see, this guy is pretty vibrant. Um... But I also like it to be just a little muted. I don't like it to be screaming eyeball primary color wheel colors, right? And so these colors are actually more saturated than you think they are. Um, when you put them on the model, they're a lot like, look, at I mean, I used these. And you wouldn't think of these as saturated colors, but they actually are. Um, and the green is actually, when you highlight it with yellow, it goes really vibrant. And, you know, when you use the orange and you, you know, highlight it up, it's actually pretty darn rich. So... I use these colors all the time. There's really no reason why I wouldn't have done triads for them. But I don't know. Um, I mean, I personally prefer my kobolds to be reddish brown. Um, so, I mean, this is a warm red and you could certainly use it for kobolds. And that's what Ron thinks it should be used for. That's why he named them this way. Uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, you could use any, any dark brown to shade this for the most part, you know, maybe black and brown would be the best one. Um, you could use any darker red, you uh, like red liner would be a good one. You could actually red liner might be the best one. You can use a dark purple like black indigo or nightshade purple. You, whenever you can use any of those colors. I mean, I, but I'm fond of saying you can highlight anything and shade anything with anything else, uh, depending on what effect you're looking for. But I mean, any, uh, truer red will work just fine with cobalt scale. It's just you don't have a dedicated triad that's using these same pigments. So if you want something that is going to look like cobalt scale, only a touch lighter, then you're kind of going to have to mix. I need to double check because I thought I did Dungeon Dweller stuff, but I may not have done triads for Dungeon Dwellers. And if I didn't do triads after, if I check my PDFs and I've not done tri triads for Dungeon Dwellers, then I will do that. But yes, so... No, I don't, John David Speaks. Um, I I like the old kobolds where they're doggy-like, like like the old ones that said yip yip. I really like uh, that kind of, uh, the doggy kobolds, so I don't like the new lizardy kobolds. But I never got into the blue noses, so I like to paint them more like they're dragon dogs, because I think dragon puppers sound really awesome. So I know I'm going to use a lot of this because it's basing, so I'm starting out with eight drops. Whenever you know you're going to use a lot of a color, I mean, don't go, don't go, uh, go big, go big on the, the puddle size. And I'm going to use a fair amount of black indigo, so I'm going to go six drops on that. And then I'm going to mix a color of the dungeon gray with some of my vampiric mist. I'm going to go with four dungeon gray. I'm going to throw some uh, goblin skin in there, which is going to switch it toward brown. And I'm going to put in maybe a drop of the kobold scale. Because you generally need to... Essentially, the red drags it away from green. This has a lot of yellow in it. When you put it into something that has a lot of black in it, it's going to go a little bit greenish or it's not going to be a really rich brown. So your kobold scale is meant to drag the color more toward a richer brown in this case. Then we put drop. Thanks, Dwarven Forge. Yeah, this is, I totally stole this style. Um, I learned a lot of these tricks that I used on this troll from Sergio, Sergio Calvo Rubio, who's a very uh, famous Spanish painter. He did a workshop at Reaper um, a couple years ago. And uh, I took his class and it was very counterintuitive to the way I usually paint because I tend to go for a much more realistic, much much less, dr less dramatic and cartoony style. But I really like Rock Troll. Like Rock Troll is staying with me. Ron does not get Rock Troll. Because I really, really like how Rock Troll turned out. So, uh, so yeah, that's... Oh, but I need a... need a little bit of stuff to hold Rock Troll with. So, since we're working on basing today, we're going to wrap Rock Troll with some bubble wrap so that I can hold on to him 
without rubbing his paint off. <laughs> well, well, now we know who you are. <laughs> You cannot hide from us. Oh, I need to add water to this. You know, adding, not adding water to my paint would not be a good thing. Um, even if it is bones. And I probably do have some finger oils on here. But I am going to add one drop of water at the least. Otherwise, it wouldn't be Anne. Well, and technically, I could probably add two. But I'll, I'll add one for now. Do, 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 do. Mix up all my paint. And often, guys, when I'm setting up these colors and I'm mixing them, I will not actually rinse my brush out between mixes because I want all these to work together. So, like, if I'm starting in my middle here, I could go here, even with all this paint still on my brush. Or what I will do is go here because that's going to throw some of my dungeon gray into this black indigo. Any, any cross over here is just going to make them work a little better together. But I don't want to take this purple and put it into here. So I will rinse out my brush here. Yeah, and it works better with certain ones, though, Dwarven Forge. Um, it, I mean, it, <laughs> it, it, because it really depends on the pigments that are used in the red. So some of them work better for this than others. So I went way too red with this. Now I've gotten kind of this um, weird kind of reddish, pinkish, grayish color. So what that tells me is I need more orange. My, actually, my... Part of the problem is my goblin skin is out of solution. Silly goblin skin. Nope. P P Painted Rock Troll is mine. He is mine. He is. I especially, I was, I'm such a, I'm such a like contrary little cuss too, because I'm like, David doesn't like him because he's green. And I'm like, I'm going to keep him. He's going to be in the case. Nothing you could do, boyfriend. So, you know, part of my, part of my keeping Rock Troll is my contrariness. Because I like Rock Troll. There we go. Now we're getting more of a brown color. Now we're going to add a little white to it. Um, if you ever wonder kind of how your color is shifting and you want to really get an idea, you should add a little bit of whatever you're using for white. Um, yep, you tried. You tried to purchase Rock Troll. I'd have to figure out in truth as to how much I would ever char <clears throat> charge for a rock troll. I would have to uh, analyze the number of hours that have gone into him. <clears throat> Frog in my throat. Okay, so when I look at this color that I'm mixing, this orange, it's actually pretty good. I'm not, I'm not unhappy with it. It's similar to the color that's the shading on this bone. <clears throat> but... If we were to actually want to bring up this color more toward this yellowy cream, we need to add more yellow to it. So that's where the ogre skin comes in. Because this is still a very orangey color. And it's a little bit washed out now. So it's not very warm. Um, that's because it's fighting that gray. But if you add a little bit, and I'm going to make sure this is in solution. So we're talking a lot about mixing today. Yo, Nomad Zeke. It's okay. You're fine. Pop that in. Everybody's late. It's all right. I forgive you all. So the minute you add that yellow in, you get a lot richer, right? You get a lot warmer. You get a lot washed, uh, a lot less washed out. Yellow is the great warmer upper. So if your color, even though you're adding a saturated color like this, if your color is still a little bit muted and grayed, try adding some yellow. It'll uh, it'll work. And this is a very saturated yellow. Ogre skin is. Um, Kind of a mixture of uh, yellow ochre and and other very intense yellows, and it's got a lot of pigment in it, which is why it really shifts the color when you throw uh, when you throw it into this mix. So this is a lot of mixing for a base of all things, but I want the colors. Well, I want to like the colors, so we're going to be doing. Yeah, if you want a really, really, really bright yellow, but that is more ochery than than yellow. This is what you're. This is what you're probably wanting to use. Ogre skin. It does not have super high coverage, but it is a great mixing and tuning tool. Um, and technically, over white primer, it's going to be perfectly fine. Okay, so now we've got a nice sandy color. Now our, our color selection for this base is looking actually really nice. This is a very um, uh, mineral caves color right here. They tend to go kind of yellowy often. Yeah, ogre skin is very 
very, very bright. Ta da! Alrighty. Hmm. All right, so I'm going to start with gray. I'm going to shade. I'm going to highlight. I'm actually going to grab also a bit of my um, Just Vampiric Mist so that I can spot mix it into various things to get lighter colors. I want the base to stay mostly dark because I don't want to be competing with the troll. Because no matter how cool your base is, you always want your model to be cooler. So do not go overboard with your basing. A lot of people do this. Especially if they're trying to do a diorama or something. They'll go huge with the base and it overwhelms everything. And the models are just kind of lost in it. So you always, when you're doing a diorama or any kind of descriptive basing, you always want to give the maximum amount of information in the smallest possible space. Morning, Val. Yes, more paints. Keep me in business, Dwarven Forge. Not that I make them anymore. Keep Sadie in a job. There you go. Keep Sadie in business. Since she took over for me. All right. So I've got some white now. I can do some mixes down the road. It's a vampiric mist. It's an off-white. You can do this uh, again on my new coaching project. I'm going to be doing this where I do not actually use a pure white as my highest color. Instead, I use an off-white. Um, we'll see how it goes. I may cry and reach for my, my pure white anyway. But uh, it's an experiment. You always want to push yourself. So I'm going to start out with just gray. Even on the edge of the base, although I'll probably come back and paint this black because that's what I like. And use a fairly large brush. This is actually my mixing brush, so it doesn't have much of a tip or anything. I may want to change that um, if I get too close to the feet. But the feet are all like lined around with uh, walnut and shadows, so I should be okay. This is coming off a little bit watery, actually. Now that I look at it, I'm like, huh. And yes, I do paint right over green stuff. I don't bother uh, priming it. Hold on, guys. I'm going to add a little bit of extra dungeon gray, and I'm actually going to add a little white to it. Woefully short of browns. You should never be short of browns. <laughs> like, browns are the utility colors. Browns are, like, where it's at. I am, that That said, I am notorious for using a lot of brown. Because I really like, um, I really like just having a couple or a few strong colors on a model, and then everything else is neutrals, because you don't get into trouble that way. So I really like cream colors and browns. Anything that lets me, so I'm going to actually add just a little bit of white into this, guys. If you need a color to cover better, and uh, it doesn't, you can add a tiny bit of white to it. You want to have a lot of drops of your main color first. Like, I think I've got eight drops of this gray. So when I added white, it shifted it a little bit lighter, but not appreciably so. Like, it is a little lighter. But I'll be able to go back in and shade it, so that's not a big deal. And adding that white is going to make it... I'm even going to paint the mushrooms, by the way. I'm going to paint everything, and then we'll come back and pick stuff out. Hello, Rax. Thank you for the resub. 15 months. I don't think there is such a thing as overdoing the warm browns. Like, if you paint a model that's mostly earth colors, you've just painted a model that's mostly earth colors. It doesn't have to be boring. If you're doing that, then the thing to do is to, like, use, like, textures or, you know, different, different highlighting ceilings to suggest different finishes or um, washes and other shading to suggest... Uh, weathering or darkening you know stuff like that it, you can paint a model all in earth browns and make it exciting but then you need to do extra work on the other stuff you're not you're not suggesting uh, excitement through color anymore you're trying to suggest you know in visual interest in different ways so oh did somebody try to link Oh. I see. Yeah, sorry about that. Sorry about the no links.
I know sometimes people like to link stuff to ask me to look at it, but that's not what this show is for. And, you know, other links and if they're if it is extremely pertinent or reaper based, then uh, the mod the mods may put it up, but otherwise, yeah. No no links. We try to keep the focus on the show. Alrighty. So now you guys can see maybe why I blocked in this shadow here. Now when I put in this gray, I can kind of blend it into that shadow and just leave a dark shadow under the troll. Let's see here. I'm going to have to slide this a little bit out of the way, guys, to get at this color. Always move your model around. Try not to, try not to shift the position of your brush hand when you're painting. I mean, at this point, I could. I've got good brush control, but um, when you're building brush control, you want to keep your brush at the same angle for as much of it as you possibly can. So it might be better, actually, for me to have gone through this way, through the legs, because that keeps my brush more at the angle that I regularly paint at. When you're developing brush control, it's very important to do that, because uh, when you're building brush control, you're building muscle memory. So the more you vary your brush stroke, the less muscle memory you are building. Um, so you essentially will take longer to get to the point where you can really control everything. Yeah, Preacher, um, the Reaper, Reaper has a Discord. And uh, you can show off your stuff on, on our Facebook. You can show it off on our Discord. And we have a forum as well, if you're into forums. All of these places are cool places to show off your Reaper Mini. I especially see a lot of them posted to Facebook, but also on the Discord, so. And our Discord community is really nice. This is a very large community. Oh no, I painted his toe. Well, okay, so right away you blorfed, so grab some water and buff off his toe. <laughs> Actually, his toe needs a little bit of a repaint anyway. My orange got a little bit rubbed off there. So I'll have to touch that up. There are definitely touch up points, guys, but I'm gonna like wait till I have the entire thing painted, including the base, and then I'm gonna go through and and uh, correct. So yeah, thanks for the link to the Discord there. John, John with the links. But yes, that's what happens when you blorf. Just rinse out your brush, grab some water, put it on the thing, scrub at it. Um, it depends also on how much paint. If you actually blorf with a lot of paint, it's actually better than blorfing with just a little brush stroke. A little brush stroke is going to dry a lot faster, so scrubbing it off can be a matter of like very fine timing. Whereas that, that was a big puddle because I was using a lot of paint on my brush. So I had an, a little extra time actually to reach for um, a solution. I'm getting everything painted in. And we will shade it and highlight it and do our stuff. Many blorfs. Yay. Blorfs. All righty. And I'll essentially let this dry just a little bit and then come back. You can see how the, the front is dried here. I'll put another layer on it. Want a nice solid coat. The last thing I paint is going to be the underside. After I've done everything else, I'll usually put a layer of black or walnut um, on the underside. And I'll usually put my initials and in the date, or at least the year, that I finished the model. It's nice to have a record whether you're used to thinking yourself of yourself as a miniatures artist or not, but putting at least the date is a good idea um, because then you can keep track of it, right? You'd be like, when did I paint that thing? And then you'd be able to lift it up and go, whoa, it was all the way back in 2015. What the heck? That kind of thing. It's useful because all of us, you know, our memories are faulty. So, and why am I holding my troll with bubble wrap? Because it's nice and soft and it means I'm not rubbing paint off of him. The key browns, in my opinion, Grey Wolf, are 9199 Russet Brown, 9109 Ruddy Leather, 9136 Walnut Brown. Uh, I would have said Chestnut Gold, but it's canceled, so 
fail. Uh, so 94.29 rich leather, 94.30 polished leather. Rich leather and polished leather uh, will give you a lot of the, the capability of doing uh, a lot of the same things that chestnut gold would allow. Rip chestnut, chest, chestnut gold. The color that nobody realized how useful it was until it was canceled. Yes, F, exactly. But yeah, as far as the browns, I always, 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 always reach for that is the list. And if you have those browns, you are, you've got like almost all the key browns that you would need for painting with like for, for canvas. Um, because russet brown is equivalent to burnt umber. You know, walnut brown is just a very black brown, which is very useful for shading, lining, and other things where you need to enhance definition, especially on small models. Uh, ruddy leather, you could go with chestnut brown instead because that's kind of a burnt sienna analog, but I find often that ruddy leather is just fine. It's got enough red in it, um, so I prefer ruddy leather. Another good like red brown is uh, mahogany brown, 9070, but it's very red. So it depends on how you want your red earth color um, to your red brown, how red you want your red brown to be. Um, but I tend to more than anything reach for ruddy leather. And then uh, the uh, rich leather and polished leather are very close to the um, like raw sienna colors. Like if you mix them and play around with them, you can get a lot of those same colors. So essentially what you're getting is... Um, you know, you want a reddish yellow, you want yellowish yellows, you want, uh, if you want an orangey yellow, I would say Harvest Brown 9200 is also your utility color if you're going up orange. Yep, leave it to Reaper John, that's right. All right, cool. It's getting up, I missed a spot. This is the time for you to look around and see if you've missed a spot also. Then I'm going to grab some, I'm going to start to grab some of my black indigo. And I'm going to start blocking it in on like the back sides of things. And by back sides, I'm thinking about where my light is coming from. So I'm Mr. Rock Troll. Light's coming down from above. So that means things that are under Rock Troll and, you know, out of this frontal light are going to be dark. And you can just paint them dark. In fact, the puddle should be really dark because the stone is wet there. So the puddle should be almost black. So I'm going to actually block that in really dark. And then I may change it as we go. But I want to remind myself that the puddle needs to be dark. It's mixing a little bit with my dungeon gray. I'm not too concerned. We're just blocking in. We're not refining. Rich leather, 94.29. Harvest brown, polished leather, ruddy leather, mahogany brown. Uh, you need to remember russet brown and walnut brown, Chibi. No, you, I mean, Chibi's got it. I mean, like I said, mahogany brown is, if you have ruddy leather, mahogany brown isn't necessary. Isn't necessary. Brown liner, I don't count as, as a brown. I count it as a black. Technically, walnut is also a black. Um... I said walnut rather than brown liner because if you're going to get one or the other, you get greater utility probably out of walnut, even though you have to thin it a lot to get it to go as translucent as brown liner does instantly. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so when you're making these decisions, you shouldn't actually, none of you who watch me with any frequency should forget these colors because I'm using them all the freaking time. Like, I have a bad memory, but seriously, folks, seriously. Y'all need to get more, like, what is it that helps memory? Vitamin D? I don't remember. <laughs> vitamin K? Vitamin C? I don't remember. There's vitamins that actually help with memory. I do I do remember that, that are supposed to be good for it. But, uh, but yeah, anybody who watches me with any level of frequency should, like, be able to recite those pretty much by heart, because it's what I always reach for. I've been trying to switch it up a little bit recently, but those colors are just so high utility. I mean, that's why canvas artists use brown umber all the time is because it ha it's a really high utility brown. It's a good medium, dark range, uh, pretty neutral. You can mix a lot of really beautiful warm browns from it. Um, 
but yeah, those are the browns I think are are MVPs. Um, if you're painting a lot of animals or uh, doing like blondes a lot, I would also pick up like leather brown, tanned leather, and uh, the amber gold, uh, golden blonde. Um, those are the the earliest light browns in from regular core. That's a uh, ninety. 30, 90, 31, 90, 32, 90, 33. You could technically skip 32 and just mix uh, 31 and 33 if you wanted, if you're budget limited. So what I'm doing is I am, see, my, I'm blocking in that purple. Wherever I'm going to get big shadows, big shadows. And I'm going to say that the light is coming from the front, so a lot of the stuff here in back is also going to be shadowed. Brian Wynn's a very... Um, grayed out brown so the reason that i do not name any grayed out browns in my list is that they're easy to mix but if you want a uh brian one reminds me of the old powder burn brown so if you like to use a lot of gray in your color schemes like you you like gray blues gray greens you know really kind of grayish browns you know if you like that muted color palette then yeah brian wins your baby so i'm gonna just block in the back of these guys because there's a heavy shadow. So if you're doing directed lighting, you have to pay attention to where your solid shadows are going to fall. Um, anything on the front that light might hit can stay gray, but there will be a shadow behind this foot. And again, I'm going to adjust a bit. I'm not going to just leave all of this. Um, although I may leave a pretty heavy shadow just behind this troll. There's going to be some lighter color here, though, because his foot is a, is light. That means this is going to be light. Some of this will disappear. I'm always asking myself about lighting lately, and especially on this model because she, he's so dramatic. So once you start a dramatic lighting effect, you can't just not do it on the base. You have to do it everywhere. So, and I'm going to have to switch to a smaller brush in a moment because um, this guy's just not going to do it too big. But I want to get stuff behind this foot because there would be shadow from behind this foot. So lots of shading, lots of shadows. But there's still light falling back here, so I'm going to have to modify this stuff. So really what I'm doing is first I'm thinking about the frontal light. Then I got to look at the light falling down here, like the light falling here and say, okay, where, where does light fall through that I need to re-highlight and, and leave my shadows accordingly. So I even start out with a basic block in and then I'm going to correct a lot of it. You reach for a pen and Anne goes too fast. Yes. Well, you know, I could just do a uh, Patreon PDF on this. Why these colors are useful. There's a reason, though, that certain artist colors, tube paints, um, have always been popular and part of most artists' palettes. Now, even in those days, you know, everybody still had favorite hues. Uh, but there's a reason why Burnt Umber's always, you know, usually on there. There's a reason why Raw Sienna is almost always on there, you know, and Burnt Sienna often, but not always. And a lot of the time it'll be like qualities, like Burnt Umber tends to cover very well. And, you know, a lot of colors in canvas paint don't cover that great out the gate. You have to add white. All right, I think, I think we're pretty good. I may want to add some finer shadows. Intense brown is um, like ruddy leather plus intense brown or even adding a little yellow into that is my go-to for animal eyes. Because uh, Kiri's eyes were very much like ruddy leather was the perfect color of Kiri's eyes. And some Shilohs have a little more golden, so then you add a little bit more gold. Um, dark brown eyes are the hardest on animals because they almost always look black. It's hard to make them show up. I am going to switch to a different chair and stretch for a second, everybody. I'm trying to take really good care of my back today. So stretchy break, stretchy break. I'm going to get this chair out of the way. Scooch, scooch, scooch. And get the other chair in. Oh, and I also dropped a paint bottle. 
don't want that. So little stretches, stretch, stretch your shoulders, stretchy breaks. You should, yes. If you've been sitting for longer, longer than half an hour, 45 minutes, um, get up and just take a quick stretch. And if you've been sitting for longer than an hour, <laughs> you're ridiculous, Shadow Raven. But yeah, if you've been sitting for more than an hour, then definitely stretch. This is uh, about 40 minutes for me, so... Yeah, it is sunny out here, actually. There. Okay, my back is a little happier with me now. Let me get the other chair. So... Now we are switching to more traditional chair with a back support pillow. This will let me rest a little bit. Then I can switch back to kneeling chair. No chair, no one chair I think is ideal. I don't know, I'm, think, I'm thinking about, I'll be a little bit, uh, I'll need to go up a little bit. Boop, 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 boop. There. Um, I'm thinking about blowing up my, um, my exercise ball and trying to use that as a chair while I'm doing this stuff. And that would be hilarious, don't you think? I'd be rolling around. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So hopefully this setup, although it's not as good for fine detail painting because I have to actually use my backrest to, uh, but it will, it should relax my back a little bit. So yeah, guys, like seriously, even if you're younger, um, you know, you, you definitely are building like back dysfunction if you're slouching a lot. So do make a point of getting up and stretching. Like it can only help. There is no way it hurts you to do this. I mean, yeah, it loses you like two or three minutes of painting time. Oh no. Um, where do I, maybe I want to use black indigo for my rim on this. Maybe, maybe I do. Instead of just going black, normally I would go black. I'm going to try black indigo though. I'm going to try to put just a very dark, just around the edge. I'm going to see how this color works. I do tend to like the black. It's kind of like black gaming bases. Like I like the black plastic. It kind of, to me, it's like a black frame on a painting. Um, that it just like kind of, you know, edges everything and makes everything stand out because the darker you paint something, the more it disappears uh, to the eye of the viewer. So when you paint your, your base rim black, you're essentially telling whoever's looking at your model, don't look at this. It's not important. And since there's really no like effort to make this edge scenic, that's really what we should do. Tea break. Yeah. Yeah. That tea break is also good. Like if you don't want to actually stretch, just making yourself get up, make yourself a latte or a tea or whatever you feel like doing a sparkling water in my case. Um, although I have a regular water hydrate. Remember after we stretch, we hydrate. Another useful thing, another useful vitamin, if you uh, get a lot of leg cramps or you're sitting a lot, is magnesium. Magnesium tends to work best with vitamin D and calcium, so there's an excuse right there for you to take a vitamin. Um, a vitamin mix or a general pill. Let's see. I'm kind of thinking the problem with black indigo is that it's definitely black. It's definitely indigo. Like, it's definitely a color. So I think we're going to have to go black. I think we're just going to have to reach for the pure black and just go for it. So yeah, so I'm going to spend a little time in this chair and then when we have to maybe get a little closer, I'll switch back to the other chair and that should enable us to get through a whole stream without Anne's back crying. Yesterday, sadly, was it Anne's back cried after the stream. I just pushed it too far. When you have to go lay down to convince your back to like relax after your stream, you know you've pushed it a bit much. So, ah, oh no, I blurfed myself. This is when Anne forgets that things are wet. Uh, oh, there are worse colors to have on myself all day than black indigo. It is one of my faves. All right. Make sure I don't have paint on my happy little bubble wrap. Oh, hold on. There we go. I did have a little bit of paint on my bubble wrap. There. All right, black. We're going to use our black full strength. Whenever you're going to use anything for a base edging, just use it full strength. I don't thin it. It's one of the few times I will not thin a paint. And this is going to essentially tell your eyeball, do not look at this. It is not important. It is not part of the sculpt.
it's one of the only times I use pure black. Like I say, normally I prefer to use a black plastic base, but there's not a good size that fits him because he's so big. Well, actually, um, when my doctor saw my back pillow, the one I'm using right now, Amy, Amy, she was so like, like, oh my gosh, this is such a great back pillow that she like wrote down the brand <laughs> and asked me where to Google search for it. I actually just uh, ordered an extra one because she said it was actually the best um, shaped and as far as depth that she'd seen. And she's a doctor who's been in business for a while. Um, so I don't feel the need to get a chair. Especially because I think any chair can be a crutch. Um, any chair, like no chair is perfect. Like I'm really discovering that that in mini painting and in all the rest of the things that I do, like writing and, you know, everything, switching it up is really the way to go. I don't think I would want to spend all day in one single chair. So instead I do, you know, my rigged standing desk for part of the day. And I do, you know, my kneeling desk when I'm doing stream for you guys for at least a bit or for whenever I'm painting. Um... And then, you know, now I, when I need to rest my back, I go to my standard chair with the back pillow. And I'm just doing this blocking in on the base rim while I have this because this chair doesn't let me, if I'm going to, if I'm going to bend forward and really get close to the model, um, I'm going to be slouching and not using my support pillow. So, but yeah, so, I mean, Hey, ergonomics is a fair thing to talk about, um, uh, on a painting stream. We probably should talk about it more to be fair. But yeah, I'm, I'm of the school that really believes that a no single chair is um, going to be the magic bullet. Um, in my experience, you or your dysfunction will adapt to almost any chair. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I think it's, it's, is it Love Home? Love Home Lumbar Support Pillow. One second, I will check for you because I'm cool and it's it's like just a normal the one that I found online were gray and black but it's just a normal lumbar support pillow it's memory foam oh uh, yeah I love home when I searched it out on Amazon yes or after my uh, appointment on Tuesday I found it right away although I didn't find the blue velvety one unfortunately this one is uh the one of my dogs ripped the zipper out <laughs> so uh I wanted a new one that was a little bit you know not compromised so I was glad I could find the uh, the brand again. But it does have... The cover's washable, so. But it's a really good shape for my back. I mean, and they're not too expensive, so... You could always try one out. I tend to like, when I need to rest my back, I put it in my chair, just my straight upright chair. And uh, just kind of lean back into it. The other place this thing saves to my life, or has saved it in the past, is in the car. It's fantastic for car. Like it usually will, it'll just give you that extra bit of support that a lot of car seats just really don't give you. So yeah, be good to your back is the bottom line. Even for those of you who are younger, David abuses himself pretty badly, but I'm like, well, I can lead the horse to water. I'm just happy he's doing yoga. <laughs> Whatever I could do to get that boy to stretch. All right, so cool. So if I wanted to, I could paint the whole bottom of the base now, but then I wouldn't be able to actually put the base down, so let's not do that. But you can see how you putting that black on there just kind of gives it a, a frame. Like, it's just, at that point, it's like, okay, well, that's the edge of the model, so I don't need to look past that, and your eyes reorient to what's on top of the base. Um, and that is what you want. That's what you want. That's why I like the black base. A lot of people, if you're wargaming, a lot of people will instead do their base rim a color, to match like their basing, their turf basing. And that makes sense because you're not doing a single piece then, right? You're doing a unit and you want your unit to go together or you're using a color to designate that this model is part of this unit. This is red, red unit. This is yellow unit or whatever, or this is light green and dark green unit. Um, you know, so that's also fair, but it, you know, so gaming models totally feel free to not um, take this advice. Uh, but yeah, for pieces where it's a display piece um, like troll, I think uh, doing the black edge is a really nice touch. All right, let's get back and do, and I'm going to resituate my seat a little bit and get a little closer and get a finer brush and thin my black indigo and start really picking out details here. Maybe doing a little wet blending, trying to make all of these little shapes come out is now our goal. So we're going to be using a mixture of our gray and our, um, our indigo 
uh, and possibly even some of our other brown colors. We'll start mixing these in. We'll start using them. I do want to add a little water to them because it's almost 45 minutes into my stream. Uh, so for these ones, if you haven't, if you're using a paint where you didn't add a lot of water up front, and remember I only added one drop of water to a lot of these, um, then you probably want to add two drops at this mark. Usually I say just add one brush full of water, but that's if you're using, like if you're using thinned paint. Um, this, these guys are still pretty thick, so if I want them to stay good for the rest of the stream, I'm going to have to work with it. Yeah, that makes sense, Coops, making the character stand out. That way your opponent can tell what's a character and what's not, because sometimes with GW models, when they're intricate, it can be hard to tell. Um, so yeah, I totally, that's a good, good strat. Good strat. You know, Gasoline Moth, slack is okay. The key here is don't beat yourself up over it. I was talking to somebody on stream yesterday um, who essentially just didn't feel the love, who had dropped out of painting for months. Um, the way to get back into it is to just get back into it uh, if you if you want to. I mean, it's all, it's all, does your hobby give you joy right now? If it doesn't give you joy right now, don't force yourself to do it and don't beat yourself up over the fact that you're not doing it. But if you miss it, if you're like, oh, I really do want to paint, don't wait for inspiration. I always use this quote, but Jack London is like, I don't wait for inspiration. I go after it with a club. Um, and he's got the right mindset. If you want to be a regular painter, be a regular painter. Make yourself sit down 20 minutes a day. In two weeks, it'll feel like habit. Like, And it's important to have kind of the same time of day or the same trigger that makes you do it. Like, okay, I wash up after supper and I sit down and paint for 20 minutes. It'll get to the point in a very short period of time where if you do that every day, even if it's 20 minutes, that's not much time. Um, then it'll come to the point where you clean up the dishes and you feel like painting. Like you really feel like painting. Uh, it's a weird thing how the brain adopts habits and you can trick your brain. Like your brain tricks you all the time. So really we've got to get some back, right? Like our brains totally totally trick us into bad habits all the time so the least we can do is uh cancel them out by getting in some good habits i mean that's why you like get into the tv habit right you get used to washing up the dishes and then you go sit down and watch you know whatever show um and then you feel then you feel weird when you don't do that and that's not because you know you sometimes it's even not that you really enjoy the habit it's just that it's a habit now so you know, kind of be aware of kind of the things that you get into and ask yourself if, if that's really what you want to be doing. You could also just watch TV and paint at the same time. Some people can do that. All right, so I'm going to start blocking in a little bit of shading on the back here. And I'm mixing in some gray. So I'm not using the pure black indigo. I'm actually mixing in some gray so these shadows are more subtle. And I will start also mixing in highlights and browns, browns when I get to it. But yeah, like you're never magically going to like suddenly feel like painting all the time if you don't ever paint. Like, and I've gone through spaces just like you described, like where I just wasn't doing it. And this is, I think, why paint clubs and, and stuff like that paint meetups once we can get back to those why those are so successful is they they make you dedicate time to the hobby yeah i do i do music or um audiobooks david can have a show going uh while he's painting he's he's able to split his attention as long as the show is mostly like he likes drama, dramas with a lot of dialogue, like courtroom dramas and stuff like that. Because then he can just listen to the show. He doesn't really need to look at anybody on the screen. Um, I used to be able to paint if it was a movie I'd seen a lot. Like, there were certain movies that I had watched 60 zillion times and I was able to put those on. Usually movies where I just liked the soundtrack, like uh, Fellowship of the Ring. <laughs> so we're just mixing in our indigo into here to bring in some shadows so that we can then highlight i'm using this rock in the back to kind of um proof of concept at this moment so i'm playing and blocking out the shapes a little bit 
And uh, then I'm going to bring in some orange and see if I like it. Doing it on a rock in the back means that then I can kind of try it out in an area that's not real visible. Uh, and then if I like it, I can go and tackle this front part. Well, you know, it is what it is. I mean, we all wish that, you know, we could actually go out to restaurants and, you know, take vacations and, you know, all that fun stuff. But there's nothing we can really do about it. So at this point, I think it's good to just look forward to a time when we can again and kind of plan our next vacation. That's what I've been doing. I'm kind of hoping, David and I planned a vacation in Hawaii this fall. So I'm hoping that um, by that time, it'll be feasible. But we really miss going out to restaurants. On the plus side, I've, I've learned to cook many new dishes. This. <laughs> yeah, Kronika, that's what I used to do. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's a problem when your paint club moves to a, a place where there's no parking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Francis, I mean, okay, I rinse out my brushes in my paint water cup. I squeeze them out. I leave them sitting for days. Um, there's no problem. Like, there is a certain, there are some people that are extremely, extremely hardcore on brush cleaning. I am not one of them, and I don't suffer for it. Um, so, I mean, you never leave your brushes with paint in them, but, I mean, paint water has so little paint compared to the amount of water that it, it's not going to ruin your brush. Um, so, I mean... I'm just rereading your thing to make sure I'm... And as far as the paint cup goes, mine sat all night, all day yesterday. I just rinsed it out this morning. So, I mean, will the inside of your paint cup get a little grungy? Sure, but, I mean, it's all dried, so it's not going to go into your water again. And, and the time it will, like if, if anything is going to flake off the edge of my Hello Kitty or my uh, Unikitty cup here, it's going to flake right when I put in fresh water. So what I do is I refill, I rinse out, refill, and then I look into the cup and see if there are any black specks or dark specks. If there are dark specks, I know that some of my paint has come off the side. I just dump it out and I refill again. I never wash my paint cups. I just rinse them out. Because, you know, my Unikitty cup is, like, only for painting. So, I never, I mean, I, I don't really need to wash it. The paint will cure. Um, it will dry. Like, even if you just rinse it and dump it out and leave it dry, which I do every once in a while, just leave it dry on the thing. Um, but, uh, I mean, what, it, the bottom line is whatever you have to do to engage, your, to, to make it easy for you to paint. Because that's like the key thing, right, to establishing a habit is it's you need to make it easy and obvious and a re rewarding. And we know that painting is pretty rewarding out the gate. So right away we're, we're a leg up, right? So easy is having your paint area all set up with water in your cup and your brushes all laid out. You know, and maybe even some of your paint colors for your project. Like if you're only working on one project at a time or you know what co what project you want to be working on, keep those paints nearby so that it's easy. Um, but yeah, I'm going to do put a little bit of brown. I love the Unikitty cup. Unikitty is my favorite. Princess Unikitty is my secret totem. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. In our right, though, you rinse the sludge out once a year. Okay, so Francis, like the only time you need to really worry, and yeah, okay, maybe, maybe over time, like I can see a tiny little dark ring, darker ring at the base of my ferrule here, but it's not impacting the amazing tip that this brush has. So there's, there's like being safe and then there's being like, you know, like a, a little bit like over, over what you really need to do. Um, I don't clean my brushes unless I have a problem. Um, I mean, a lot of people though, a lot of people like to clean their brushes all the time, but it's not what I can say with confidence is that if you just rinse out your brush in your paint water cup, whatever little particles are in there is not going to ruin your brush. Like if it, if it did, all of my brushes would be ruined that I have been using for the last year. I have not switched up my brushes, except this is a brand new one, but I mean, I still have my other one and it still works just fine. It's just a little bit of a different shape now. Um, the other Raphael I've been using. So... 
But all the rest of these brushes, these guys are weird ones and I have them just to play with. But everybody else I've been using all year. So, yeah, and Nara makes a point. If you really doubt, then you can just wipe your brush on a paper towel. I can usually tell by looking at them, but yeah. But like, okay, so if, you're, if your brush cleaning habit means that you're not painting as much because it's making it harder for you to paint, then I would just say, okay, brushes, we're just going to go with this and I want to paint more often and then see. Like if you notice that you're having more brush problems after that, then maybe you do need to rinse out your water cup more often or, or maybe rinse your brushes a little bit more vigorously in the water. Um, or, you know, maybe uh, like I do, half the reason I can still, you know, do this stuff uh, as easily with my brushes is that I'm working with thinned paint and I rinse a lot. I rinse every time I have to reload my brush practically. Um, I never, I almost never reload my brush straight out of here. I almost always rinse it, point it, and then reload it. And because I'm rinsing my brushes so very often, that's part of why I don't have a problem with paint sticking up in the ferrule. So, like, I'm the first one to advocate for rinsing your brushes, like, often and taking good care of them as far as don't leave them in the paint water and, you know, try not to smoosh them or leave them somewhere where their tips are going to get dented. But I, I stop at, like, that. Like, I really feel like you... I feel like you can get really super anal about brush care and it doesn't do you good if it's keeping you from painting. That is just my opinion. So, like I said, if you start not rinsing your brushes as well, uh, you know, and you notice problems, that's where you can say, screw you, Anne. You don't know everything and, uh, and adopt a different uh, tactic. I'm going to go back to my old brush just to prove that they still work. Yay! So you guys were saying that you wanted me to paint more monsters. Um, do you have a monster in mind? I know the Ogre Juggernaut was one that was brought up by Pendrake. I'm going to use my brown color here. I've thinned it a bit, so it's going to be more subtle. I'm going to use it to start bringing up some warm tones in these rocks. Specifically on the side where the light is going to be falling. Or in areas where the light is going to be falling. So mostly on the top of areas. Well, I mean, better to err on that side than the really careless side that ruins brushes, right, Francis? But now you know that you have a little leeway, so. I mean, it's good to ask these questions. It's never dumb. It's, it's always good to ask the questions. And some people are going to have different opinions. I mean, and all of us have different standards for our brush care. As long as your brushes stay good for the amount of time you need them to stay good, you're good. I'm using some gray to just bring some of that color back into these rocks down here so I can also warm up the base. See how these rocks look warmer now since I've used a little bit of this orange color. <laughs> pick a few monsters and let you vote. Oh, pig and pumpkin cart does not excite me. I mean, yeah, I'm looking for monsters because that's what other people said the other day when we when I asked if they want to do PCs or monsters. Like, the car carts are very boring to me. It's it's just wood. Um, and I, I mean, to make it more interesting, I'm going to switch chairs again, guys, and do a stretch. Um, to make it more interesting, I'd have to, like, sculpt extra weathering onto the boards and stuff. I guess that could be a project. So maybe I'll think about it. Depends on how big it is, too. I don't want to take on a really big model. All right, so we're going to come back. We're going to stretch. Let's see what time it is. Okay, I've got 25 minutes left. Mushroom Queen? Yeah, yeah. She's one that people have brought up before. That would be fun to do. Your cats are more likely to play with the mini. Yeah, animals. Uh, yeah, Julie, of course. <laughs> see, if Bob could get in there and type, I bet he would say vampires or some undead. What's Which one is the title lurker? Is that the crab monster that I already tried to paint? He was going pretty well. He was a blue horseshoe crab type. Yeah, my lower back feels hot, so I'm going to just kind of stretch a little bit, guys. Mushroom Queen. Everybody seems to want... I've already painted her. The one that's in the, in the uh, store is my, the one I painted, Chibi. Mm-hmm. 
Yes, he says vampires. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Well, I did want to do a vampire, though. And I guess Monique uh, fits that, although it's bigger. Trippiest paint job. <laughs> yeah, some of them I have already done. I don't know, Clavicus. Like, I think the Mushroom Queen could be fun. Um, I love Minotaurs. I love Minotaurs. I'd have to look at Beholders. We, we don't have a real Beholder. We've got things that are like Beholders. The problem with Owlbears is that they're all one color. <laughs> oh, the Andromeda Queen, the Alien Chica. Yeah, I, I the Patrick Heath sculpt, right? All right, I'm going to try to sit down again, guys, but my back is acting up. So we're going to do just a short thing, but if my back continues to act up, then I'm gonna I'm gonna call the stream just a little bit early. We're gonna kind of ease back into this stuff. Uh, let me make some notes though on what you guys have been saying about monsters because I asked you for a reason. I don't want to forget it. It'll go right out of my head the minute I don't have. Uh... I think the title lurker is the crab one that I already tried to paint. He was okay. Bones five minotaur. I'm I'm gonna make a note. I'm I like minotaurs, and usually Jason is the one who's sculpting them, and he does great minotaurs. So I'll write down the bones five minotaur when we get the bones five stuff in. Okay, fungal queen. Julie wants me to do an animal of some sort or a creature that is. Hey, you did a hippogriff, didn't you, Julie? Like I'll look hippogriff, cause that would be fun, cause we could talk about more feathers and maybe a different kind of color scheme and we could also talk about horse patterns question mark bob wants me to do a vampire and somebody said the 54 millimeter monique which would fit the bill for both question mark uh you may skip out on the spider streams i haven't uh, nobody said a spider yeah nobody is uh Nobody, or maybe one person did, but I, yeah, sp no, no cave spiders. Yeah, spiders, eh. Spiders make me go meh. If people, when we have so many people reacting with phobia in the channel, I'm just like, yeah, no, no, no. Hippogriff sounds cool. Yeah, I like the idea. Julie's monsters are always so nice. Um, so I seem to recall a really nice hippogriff that Michael Proctor painted. So maybe we'll, okay, so... I've got a vampire, a minotaur, a fungal queen. I'll think about, I'll look around. I'll look around. Maybe the bones for a female. Oh, is that the one that Julie painted that's kind of a finesse or a finer, finer sculpt? 77752. Um, minotaur. I know, there's so many good minotaurs in the Reaper line. I enjoy almost all of them. So I could look at, uh, look at them and see which ones are really exciting terror fish all right my back is feeling a little bit better after standing so i'm gonna sit down we're gonna try to actually get some warmer colors on these mushrooms and uh hopefully make it through the entire stream this is the hope let's see how it happens but yeah if it's if um, if the back acts up then i'm gonna gonna call it early just because i'm trying to get better not worse <laughs> And uh, being nice to it is definitely a thing. Alrighty. Kind of grabbing some of my yellow with my orange now. These uh, off kind of minerally colors, oxide colors. And uh, just going to try to kind of uh, bring in the edges a little bit. Bring up the, uh, the tops. It kind of gives you that little a little bit of warm look. And it's basing, so you don't have to be real precise with it. I'm going to throw some of this color also onto the floor. Now, we're shading with a very different color than our highlight here, so it could almost start to look a little opalescent. And we can keep an eye out for that and decide if we want it or not. But see how that warm color is really popping against the indigo? And it's a similar color to his feet. So we are doing that integra integrated stuff there then where we're bringing in some of the same kind of colors we were using um, on the troll into the basing. 
And I'm just using a stippling stroke. It's pretty rough. But it suggests some texture. It's an easy texture suggest. And let me grab a little bit of this yellow, add a little bit of white, bring it up. And I want to add some more water. Whenever you want to stipple and make, uh, make a lighter color kind of blend in, you need to add more water. Because uh, the minute you add white, everything is going to show up. Every little dot is going to show up. So you can come back and kind of blot it with your brush. But the answer is really to use a lot of water if you're using lighter colors that have white added in and you want to do stipples. Because otherwise the white is so opaque, it's going to be very precise. The dots are going to show up very precise. So if you wanted a blended look, it's going to fight you. Um, so got to... Got to keep that in mind. Sometimes you might want that precision, like if you're trying to suggest really small details on the base, like a lot of little kind of like sand granular texture, if I'm trying to do that here. Let me get in a little bit and get on the... There. So like, yeah, that's not bad. But you can see how I'm bringing in this warmer color here, and it's changing the way that everything looks, right? It's not just kind of purple and gray anymore. We're getting some more organic look on the basing. Uh, I'd have to switch up everything, Francis. The problem is that, uh, hmm, let's see, let me write that one down, uh, John. Hold on, where's my pen? Where's my pen? Uh, seven, seven, six, five, eight. Hold on. Seven, seven, six, five, eight. I'll look it up. Yeah, I'm ordering an ice pack for the back in Ara, for sure. Only helps me right after the stream, though. Um, kind of hard to strap one on to me. <laughs> Plus, I, uh, I don't know that I'd want to while I was actually doing the things to make the back, you know, unhappy with me. I don't know what the good strategy is for that. Um, as far as getting a standing desk, Chibi, I'd have to get rid of my art desk here. I'm very fond of my art desk. I mean, hold it. It's the one heavy, breakable, you know, kind of, uh awkward thing that I actually did pay to haul from Texas out here. And and they don't make these anymore, like this design, which I really like. It's a glass topped, it tilts and does cool stuff. Um, so a standing desk for me, I guess, it's a kind of kind of like David. He likes his desk too. He would like a standing desk, but it doesn't really make sense. So I tend to use my, my, I tend to just kind of cobble together a standing desk when I'm writing and doing it that way. Chimera has a lot of moving parts. I don't know about a Chimera. Cat tongue is not silky smooth. Uh, yeah, chibis are not really my whole thing. I am not the best chibi painter. Like, I have not painted one. I have partially painted one. But uh, chibi style is uh, not my best. Not my best look. All right, yeah, the back is definitely upset, so I'm going to call it just a little bit early, guys. I don't want to push it. I'm going to uh, leave you with a, a troll base here. If only I could get a standing desk put together. But yeah, definitely, definitely an unhappy back. Just a little bit of one, so we want to call it. Yeah, this is better than it felt yesterday. I'm, I'm being smart, right? I'm calling it early. So, John, who do we have to raid today? We're going to be raiding Paul Pape Designs. Uh, yesterday, I raided into him raiding somebody else. So uh -huh. oh, okay. I went and double-checked. He's going to be on for another hour and a half or so. So we'll, okay, we'll hit cool. him today. All right. Awesome. Um, Let me back up here. So today, we spent time talking about basing strategies, about um, why you would use a neutral color to put a rim around your base, about mixing base colors, using colors in your base that you also used on the model to make it look more like the things are tied together. So hopefully, you see how that kind of works. Um, with the start of our base here. Now that we've got everything blocked in, this we should be able to finish this guy next time. So next time Rock Troll comes around, be there for the finish. Yeah, I just have to be I just have to be nice to it, Kurniko. So when it gives me signs that it's really getting irritated, I need to stop. This is not like Anne's usual thing. Like I used to just power through this stuff, like seriously. And that's why I'm in the situation I'm in today. So everybody, so get ready to rumble. All right, guys, so have fun, and uh, tomorrow is the cat person, is um, Shadow Eyes, our cat folk rogue. 
I hope you have a great day and I will see you all tomorrow, okay? Um, I'm not sure about the D&D stream later. It depends on my back, but I'll try, okay? Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Uh, there's going to be no painting platinum later this afternoon. Uh, she is moving her house, so she took today off. Um, we will be back later tonight for Reaper Live. Uh, get ready to see a bunch of Reaper virtual stuff. Um, let me start the raid as I'm talking. Uh, one second. All right, we started it. Um, Reaper Reaper virtual classes are now live. So if you guys haven't seen those, head on over to reapervirtual.com. Go to the classes tab. Um, game signups are now live as well. So Pathfinder Society, Starfinder Society, and 5e games are up. There's a bunch of Starfinder and Pathfinder people who work at Paizo that wrote games. They're going to be running games. So I think that's really exciting. Um, so yeah, see you guys later tonight. Have fun. Go say, go say hi. And I think we're done. Flip the switch. I think it's perfectly fine. <laughs>